True and Fair View, Subjectivity and Bias Learning Quiz. Uh, a dozen questions to test your understanding concepts in these areas. Explain what is meant by a true and fair view. True in terms of financial reports implies factually correct and prepared in accordance with appropriate accounting standards and free from material errors and omissions. And fair, prepared without bias, that the financial statements reflect the substance or economic reality of the company's position. Explain what is meant by a qualified set of financial statements. Qualified in this context means that the external auditors have found a material error or omission in the financial statements of record which they are required to report. And we'll move on to subjectivity. Explain how the values for the following are subjective in nature. And we'll start with current assets, deposits with banks, accounts receivable net of allowances, so the value reported in the statement of financial position, and the, the accounts which make it up, inventory and prepaid expenses. So deposits with banks. In recent times, we've had the example of Icelandic banks where international depositors struggle to get the funds which they deposit with the banks back. So the value here is dependent on a management view that the banks will be able to repay the, the funds that the company has got deposited with those banks. Um, accounts receivable. The gross value is determined by the IFRS rules on revenue recognition which determine when a company is allowed to take the revenue from a sale through the income statement. Um, and then we've got the impairment allowance. The first part of this is a view on the overall creditworthiness of customers as to whether the customers are, will be able to repay in full. And for those customers where uh, there, is, there is an identified impairment event, estimates of the bad debt, debt losses on outstanding invoices to those customers is a management estimate. And then we've got accounts receivable net, uh, which is the value on the statement of financial position. This incorporates subjectivity from the gross value and the impairment allowances. Inventory, we've got two types. We've got identifiable and indistinguishable. So in terms of identifiable, the whole, the whole accounting concept of, account, of historic cost accounting is subjective in nature. It doesn't reflect a market or a replacement cost. And under value, under historic cost accounting, under full costing, will be will be affected by the use of overhead allocation and the choice of overhead allocation method. Um, and in the case of indistinguishable inventory, the the selection of um, the accounting policy, whether it's whether it's FIFO or ABCO under IFRS or FIFO, LIFO and ABCO under US GAAP, um, will, will affect the the end value for inventory. And for both types of inventory, whether the inventory is in some way impaired, in which case what the what the, the value for the net residual value, which is the <coughs> the expected sales price, less the cost to get it to sell, um, those are both estimates. And then finally, prepaid expenses. This value here is a precise value, but it, but those prepaid expenses only have value if the firm which has been paid in advance will be able to deliver the services uh, at, at that future time. So it's a view on whether the firm will be able to deliver those services. And then we'll move on to non-current assets. So subjectivity of property, plants and equipment, net of accumulated depreciation, investment property, intangible assets, net pension assets and goodwill. So the gross figure for property, plants and, uh, and equipment well, the first thing to note is that this is this is affected by the method of acquisition. Whether if we take a, a property, whether the, the company has constructed it itself, um, if it has constructed itself, whether it capitalizes or expenses income interest, um, whether it has bought it outright from a, from a third party, a developer or another firm, in which case it would be the purchase cost rather than construction cost, or whether it's acquired the property through um, the acquisition of another firm in which case it will be valued at appraised value at the time of the acquisition. <coughs> we then got accumulated depreciation, and the, the amount of depreciation for a particular asset will be, de will be determined by the method which has been used, a straight line reducing balance, 
and management estimates for the assets' useful economic life and their residual value. Uh, and the net value, so gross property, plant and equipment, less accumulated depreciation, uh, incorporates subjectivity from the gross value and accumulated depreciation. Investment properties, well, these are based on an estimated appraised value of similar properties, uh, and that appraised value will, will vary by value. Um, and then we've got intangible assets. Well, the first thing to note is that the value excludes assets which are developed in house. Um, it only includes assets that have been acquired um, and amortization, so, so, so the management view on the value of the, the assets at the time that they were acquired. Um, and amortization has the same issues as depreciation for, for tangible assets does. And if we look at net pension assets, when this appears, it's driven in part by the value for the defined benefit obligation, which in turn is driven by actuarial assumptions, um, how long people will live for salary inflation, um, and, and crucially, the choice of discount rate to take the, the defined benefit obligation back to the current present value. And then we've got goodwill, which is not actually an asset. Um, it is an accounting um, artifact, and this is the difference between the net revalued assets and the purchase price of a firm that the company has acquired. Uh, and revalued assets, those, those values are estimates from valuers uh, and the purchase cost itself is an estimate of the acquired firm's value at the time of the acquisition by the company's management. Give two principal ways in which management can achieve goals of higher period profit and book value. So in terms of um, revenue, bringing forward revenue recognition and, um, and also bringing forward realisation of any asset gains. Both of those will have the effect of increasing profit and book value. And uh, the other side of the income statement is the expense side, so pushing back or deferring expense recognition to, to later periods um, and pushing back the realisation of any asset losses or recognition of an impairment of assets that the, the firm um, owns. Identify two biases that may adversely affect the integrity of the firm's financial reports and um, identify their underlying causes. So the two sources, the first one is management self-interest bias, uh, and this is, this is the desire to make the firm's financial performance look good to the owners and to other creditors. Uh, and and the, the, the proximate cause of this is, to, is management's desire to protect their jobs and, and uh, where they are remunerated on the performance base to earn performance base pay or bonuses. And then we've got external orders, their conflicts of interest. Um, from wishing to maintain fee income from retaining audit company um, or audit business, uh, from wishing to protect income from other services such as consultancy and advisory that they also provide to their audit clients. Give some examples to show how management can achieve the goals of higher period profit and book value by first legitimate operational action, and then secondly legitimate creative accounting choices. So legitimate operational action, so sales push, uh, discounted prices, expediting delivery of goods that have already been ordered in order to get the, the re 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 revenue into this period, reducing operating expenses by cutting back on discretionary expenses such as training, um, booking one-off gains on asset disposals. All of these will have the, the effect of increasing profits in the short term. And then we've got um, legitimate creative accounting choices, um, we'll start with depreciation accounting estimates, and just using straight line. Um, if we increase the useful economic life and residual life estimates, we will spread out the depreciation over a longer period, and it will be a lower absolute amount. Um, and each period will have a lower depreciation charge um, and optimistic estimates in terms of bad debt recoveries. Um, aggressive pension actuarial assumptions, for example, having a higher discount rate than their peers and selective reappraisal of investment properties that are appreciated. All of these will have the effect of uh, increasing profits. Give some examples to show how management can achieve the goals of high period profit using fraudulent accounting choices. Well, the first is on terms of revenue recognition. 
recognising revenue that has not been earned in the current accounting period. So keeping the books open longer so that revenue from the next period, which is earned, is, is recognised in the prior period. Um, and next is recognising revenue, uh, which is being anticipated. So before the goods are actually delivered. And the most egregious of all, recognising revenue uh, from sales to fictional customers for fictional goods. And on the expense side, failing to recognise losses from impaired assets. Um, and concealing losses by netting them against gains and evergreening bad debt, which simply means in the case of banks, lending customers in default enough money for them to be able to service their outstanding debt to the banks so that it appears to be conforming. I'll give examples to show how management can achieve the goals of lowering period profits to smooth reported earnings by legitimate operational action. So first is to cut back on sales promotions, things like discounting prices, um, delaying delivery of any goods that have been, already been ordered to delay the revenue recognition to the next period, um, booking losses from asset disposals, um, increasing discretionary expenses on things such as trading and travel and, and general uh, company marketing, which is not sales directed. Give examples to show how management can achieve the goals of lowering peer profits to smooth reported earnings by legitimate creative accounting choices. So cutting back production levels below planned um, to increase cost of sales through the reversal of the other recoveries of manufacturing overheads, over providing for credit losses, so making greater charges into the impairment allowance than is actually required. And this gives an opportunity to write back these over provisions at a later date. Um, selling asset, assets that are at a loss, so realising those losses while holding on to any that have gains. And uh, if there are assets which are impaired, taking this opportunity to have aggressive write downs of those assets. Explain what is meant or understood by the auditor expectations gap. So the auditor's expectation gap, many people think that external auditors go through every transaction looking for fraud or any wrongdoings and, and, and go through values, uh, through assets to ensure that assets are fairly valued. But this is not the case. Um, auditors look at a relatively small sample of transactions and assets. Uh, they, 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 they do not look at everything. Um, their job is to provide a reasonable assurance, whatever that may mean. Not an absolute one. Identify specific issues that may adversely affect external auditor independence and objectivity. Well, the first is simply the coziness of the relationship between the external auditor and the clients. Um, it's difficult to be critical of your friends. Um, the second is the desire for external auditors not to uh, lose clients. Audit work is, is a safe, steady source of income um, and, and also a desire not to be seen as less helpful to corporate management than other auditors because that they risk not gaining business in the future and potentially having other clients move to auditors who seem to be more accommodating. And finally, if they do provide consultancy and advisory work to their audit clients, um, they will not want to adversely affect that business by, by giving negative views on the audit side. So desire to hold on to any more profitable consultancy and advisory that work they provide to audit clients. What regulatory action can be taken to try to reduce these conflicts of interest at external auditors? There's really two. The first is mandatory order to rotation. So, so that the, the auditors are replaced over a certain number of years. Uh, and the second is limits on the level of fees as a proportion of audit fees that firms can generate from their non-audit work at their audit clients. Explain why regulators are reluctant to prosecute any of the big four for audit failures. The prosecution of Arthur Anderson led to the collapse of the firm uh, there are now only four major audit groups. No, no regulator wants to see this number four. So, so they, they, can, they can be um, 
called too big to fail, too vulnerable to prosecute for this reason. Uh, and most cases that the likes of the SEC take against the major audit firms are settled out of court um, with, with, with penalties imposed which simply lead to higher fees being charged to audit clients in the future. And those are the questions we've looked at today.